Okay, good morning. Good morning, folks. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much for, for coming. Uh, my name is, is Channing Arndt. I'm the uh, director of the Environment and Production Technology Division at the International um, Food Policy Research Institute here in, uh, in Washington, D.C. And it is my privilege and pleasure to be able to uh, moderate this event today. I'm going to start off with just a couple of points of housekeeping. First, this event is being recorded, live streamed, and translated into French and Spanish. And it will continue to be available at uh, live.worldbank.org after the event concludes. That's first point. Second one is we will be taking questions uniquely online. Uh, some online viewers have already put in questions. You can put in questions at the hashtag why rural. So you know, why am I so pleased to be here today? Uh, IFPRI, the International Food Policy Research Institute, is a part of the CGIR, which is the world's largest agricultural innovation network. So we're very interested in this particular topic, which is this future of rural space. Um, so this is, I think this event could be viewed as a continuation of a conversation that we've been having pretty intensively over the past month. So exactly a month ago, September 16th, we had Harvesting Prosperity here in this, in this room where we talked about technology and productivity in agriculture and some of its broader benefits uh, to the macro economy. On September 23rd, there was the Climate Summit in New York. Climate Action Summit, and we released the flagship report from the Global Commission on Adaptation, which really focused on smallholder farmers and the challenges smallholder farmers are, are facing. Today, it's the future of rural space. And I think a commonality that we have in all of this is a focus on action and solutions. And I like that. That's why I joined IFPRI. That's what IFPRI does. That's what the CGIR does. But most importantly, it's what our panelists do. So we have a great panel from the private sector, from government, and from NGO. It also spans Europe, Africa, and Asia. So I think you're really going to like it and look forward to it. But before we start and get to our panelists, we're going to ask Laura Tuck, who's the Vice President for Sustainable Development, to come up and give us an overview of where we are. So thank you for coming, and please, Laura, come. Hi, everybody. Wow, it's great to see so many people interested in this topic. So what I'd like to do in the next 10 minutes or so is just why do we care? Um, why are so many people here interested in it? Why do we do a whole seminar on this? And what's interesting about this topic is it kind of goes a little bit against the flow of what we've been discussing over the last few years really has been about urbanization, the big trends. And it's been so important. So we kind of wanted to say, wait a minute, there's something else going on here that, that merits a look. So when we think about it, um, the share of global population in urban areas right now, most of you know, is probably about 55%. And given the trends that we expect with demographics and et cetera, et cetera, we think this could go to about 68% by 2050. So that's a, that's a big number. And there's this prevailing view, um, including among most economists, that the future of most rural people sort of lies in them moving to cities eventually. And if you look, even the World Bank did its own global, uh, did its own world development report that was called Reshaping Economic Geography, and it concluded that spatial disparities in production are probably inevitable and that economic growth is more successful when production is concentrated spatially in cities and towns. This is something that we said. Now, it's true, and I think we would all agree, that well-managed urbanization can reduce poverty in a good way. And if it's done right, it can even help drive positive development in rural areas. But as everybody knows, urbanization has its own challenges. Cities struggle, large amounts of immigrants coming in, they need to provide infrastructure and services, housing, um, they have to control waste and pollution and congestion, et cetera, et cetera. Cities around the world are sprawling um, if they're not planned well, instead of becoming um, denser and more efficient. And, and oftentimes the congestion then erodes the benefits that we get from concentration. 
So at the same time all this is happening, we see that networking technologies are starting to much better connect people, goods, services across rural and urban spaces in all kinds of pretty cool new ways. And, and probably most importantly, there's some 3.4 billion people who live in rural areas, all of them aspiring for a better life, income, health, families, et cetera. And According to the projections we have, in 2050, there will still be 3.1 billion people. So that's a lot of the global population that we need to care about and what's going to happen to them. And it means that we still need a big focus on rural areas in 2019, 2020, and beyond. Now, for us at the World Bank, rural development is especially relevant. Um, for our client countries where we know that the share of the rural population is actually higher than the, the global average. And we know that reality in rural space can be tough, can be really harsh for the extreme poor. We also know that the share of the extreme poor in rural areas has risen over the last two decades. So back in 2000, 2001, we did a rural development report that estimated rural poverty at more than two thirds, something like 68, 67%. And that's compared to the 80% today. So you see this big increase in the poor in this physical space. So despite all the advances that we've seen on technology, the lack of connectivity is still in fact holding most rural communities back. And this is even true in high income countries. Even in the US, only some 65% of rural residents have access to broadband. So you can just imagine what it's like as we move to our client countries and more into, into low income countries. Something like 40% of the world's extreme poor live in forests, at the edge of forests, or in mixed sort of farm savanna areas and depend to some extent on forest products to meet their income and their, their subsistence needs. But that safety net, as you can see on the slide, is starting to disappear. Forest area per capita has dropped from 0.85 hectares per person in 1990 to less than 0.5 hectares in 2015. So you see this loss over time um, as a, as a contribution. It's just one indicator. I'm sure you know many others about what's happening to, to forest loss. But rural people also, in addition to just services that come from forests, also have a lot lower access to your general basic services, health, education, than the urban counterparts, as I'm sure um, is logical. Education disparities are driving the, the migration um, because lots of young people um, don't feel like they're getting the kind of capacity building that they need. And that adds to what's already the flow from adults who are seeking employment and leads um, logically then to the brain drain we're seeing in a number of rural areas. Now, because the poor are disproportionately, who live in rural areas disproportionately depend on agriculture for a living, then they're also more vulnerable to disruptions caused by climate change or natural disasters, which then leads to more volatility in food production. And as many of you know, we've seen a rise in global hunger for the third year in a row. So some of you may be familiar with our report, Groundswell, I think it's here, if you haven't seen it, um, which estimated that climate change could result in a huge amount of internal migration, people having to move because their physical spaces are, are too vulnerable. Um, some 143 million people by 2050, and we just looked at three regions, so of course that number is much bigger, unless we undertake really climate smart and pro-poor action. And the rural space, I think, is really where we can deliver social and economic inclusion and environmental goods and services. So that's really the main message. It's where I think that positive change can make a huge difference to the people who live there and to the planet. So we really want that combination and we want both. So today, you're gonna to hear from a great panel about a lot of really successful efforts onto how we can do this by tapping into business innovation, education, savings groups, better linkages between producers and consumers, irrigation, sustainable land management, so on and so forth. But before I turn it over to them, I know that's the most exciting part, I just want to mention five opportunities why I am optimistic 
about the future of rural space. So the first is that when we reduce agriculture productivity, we can really reduce poverty. We know this is the case, and we, need, we just really need to be doing this. GDP growth is strongly linked to urbanization, but overall poverty reduction is closely tied to progress in rural areas. So we now have lots of research that confirms just how important agriculture development is for, for poverty reduction, and it shows how investing in stronger agricult agricultural growth can make a big difference in people's lives. So you all know about Green Revolution, how crops increase, crop yields increase sixfold in East Asia over the last four decades. In places like Sub-Saharan Africa and parts of South Asia, they only increased by two, and the associated poverty reduction was therefore much more disappointing. So this is clearly an area where we can make an impact. And we also, um, Channing just referred to this report, Harvesting Prosperity. And, we'll, and as he said, one of the things that it shows is how if you, if you invest in R&D and technology adoption by farmers, um, you can really get new growth in the sector. And it showed that R&D is really lacking in the regions precisely where we need it most, like Sub-Saharan Africa in particular. And so this is an agenda with a big commitment. We know we can make a difference, so we could take it forward. We can help countries themselves um, redirect part of their agricultural spending toward locally adapted R&D and technology adoption, and we can try to mobilize additional financing for institutions like, if, like CGIR that are really doing um, research for um, resilient, climate smart agriculture globally, and we know that can make a big difference. And that comes to the second point, which is about technological change. And you're going to hear a lot about this today, but we know that we can leverage new science and technology, new science and technology to solve old problems. So, you're going to hear and you know that we're seeing this huge explosion in new technologies that are just starting to be applied in, in rural space. In a, in a way, um, agriculture is one of the least disrupted um, sectors when you look at all the technology that's, that's changing, but it is starting now to catch up and we need to drive it. And when you look at problems like livestock emissions or poor nutrition or long and scattered supply chains or things like how expensive machinery is for individual farmers, or the massive inefficiencies in land and water use, um, lack of energy access. We know that all of those can be addressed in some way through the use of better technology. For instance, just in China, um, Alibaba, which most of you know, the e-commerce platform, has had a huge impact on farmer incomes by opening up new buying and, and selling opportunities. And we know there's so much more potential, and you're going to hear about this today, to make sure that all people, men, women, all people really benefit from this. So the third opportunity is really to help people in rural spaces respond to growing demand and use this then to lift their economies. We know that demand for goods in rural areas is going to keep growing, no matter where people live. We all know that food demand by 2050 is projected to increase to double. But it's not just agricultural product, products. You know that there's, there's tourism. We're seeing more and more examples where towns are being revived economically and socially um, and, and in, a, in a way that's compatible with the environment and nature, um, natural resources, we can reduce poaching, mining, um, deforestation, and bring people in to do um, constructive things in a way that protects nature and benefits people. So we also know that a lot of tourism doesn't do that, but if we focus on managing it, we can make this a, a positive contribution. The fourth reason has to do with gender equity, and this is an area that's really near and dear to my heart. And what's interesting in rural areas is that some of the major constraints by rural women offer the potential if we could just address them for future development. So if you think about it, globally, female farmer yields are 20 to 30% lower than those of males. If we just closed that gap, 
there would be five to 10% fewer hungry people and a three to 4% increase in output. And we know how to do this. We know rural women face constraints on low literacy, low numeracy, less access to inputs. Over half of all rural women lack basic literacy, which, and same for numeracy, which constrains them from accessing all this new technology and applying the information that they get. It makes it hard for them to manage their money, to engage in trade, to access information, and so forth. So we at the World Bank, we've helped co-organize a campaign with a number of our partners called Stand Her Land. And the initiative is really working to empower women to get their land rights so they have more control over their land and stronger incentives to invest. We know there's a lot more that people are doing, a lot more that can be done, and this could make a huge difference. So just to, to finalize, the fifth opportunity I see in rural space is where we can really deploy nature-based solutions that can help address climate change and reduce natural resource degradation at the same time we're making people's lives better. So we know that nature-based solutions could provide around 30% of cost-effective climate mitigation interventions that we need just by 2030 if we're gonna try to stabilize temperatures to below two degrees. We also know on the adaptation side that conservation of natural ecosystems can protect against floods, droughts, landslides, so on and so forth. You all know this story. It's, it's just, it's not rocket scientists, science. We know examples of terracing, implementing partial grazing bans, um, growing trees on farms, raising livestock under trees, all kinds of other, you know, sustainable water land management techniques that, that can really build productivity and nature conservation together. They lead to yields. Interesting enough, they lead to big increases in yields, better livelihoods, better diversity, more carbon storage, even as we see the climate situation getting more challenging. So this is, this is a win-win across the board. We also know there are a lot of green jobs. You guys are probably pretty familiar with the statistics. The new climate economy report from 2018 said that, that sustainable food and land use business models, developing those further could be worth $2.3 trillion and provide 70 million jobs by 2030. Those are big numbers. You just have to take away big numbers. Lots of opportunity out there. If we focus on doing it right, um, we can get these, these gains. So um, I, just, I just want to finish by saying when incentives align, we can find all kinds of impressive ways that are good for people, good for people living in this space, good for the planet. We know that the experiences that you all have and that our panel is going to share with you give us lots of reason to, for hope. We know that we need to spread the word. We need to build courage, vision, tools to bring this collectively um, and, and to do more in this area. I hope you all agree. I want to thank our panelists ahead of time from, for coming to share their experience and turn it over to them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. I'm going to invite all the panelists to come up and, and uh, grab, a, grab a seat. And uh, we'll go through um, briefly. I'll, I'll introduce them individually. They'll, they'll talk for about three to four minutes. Uh, and then we'll move to uh, a conversation, a question and answer session until about uh, 1220 or so. So our, our first panelist is on my left, Ms. Alka Upadaye. She is Additional Secretary, Ministry of Rural Development in India. Um, she's going to speak to us about uh, innovative approaches deployed in the National Rural Livelihoods Mission, such as women's self-help groups, financing and digital tools, and the national program that is trying to take these innovations to scale. So please go ahead, Alka. Thank you so much. So I'll first talk about the rural spaces and what has India done in the recent past. <clears throat> A very important point brought out was rural infrastructure. So we've achieved almost 97% connectivity to population about 250 and 500 in the you know, mainland areas. 99% <clears throat> electrification happened to the rural households through our Sobhagya scheme. 99% sanitation levels achieved and almost 100% achievement in terms of green, clean energy, which is now being used for cooking through the gases which have been distributed. 
Gender, <clears throat> when we talk about rural areas, there are three kinds of exclusions that are experienced, economic, social, and financial. And women are often hit harder when it comes to these exclusions. So what have we been trying to do? We have been trying to do social mobilization of women, bring in some kind of financial inclusion, and lead all of this, number one, to improve the consumption. Because the historic, historically, what's happened is there has been very little money, which is in the hands of women. And they have been forced to go to the money lenders and take money from them at absolutely high rate of interest, roughly 20% or 30%, and which has been one of the causes of the vicious circle of poverty. A gender-led program under the National Rural Livelihoods Mission has been taken up. These success stories are really encouraging. The Jivika program in Bihar, which was also funded by the World Bank, has shown great results. Nationally, if I talk about some figures, the numbers are really, really mind-boggling. <clears throat> so we have about 5.6 million self-help groups. We have mobilized roughly 60 million of women. The credit linkage, so I'm coming to financial inclusion. So financial inclusion has been to the tune of $32 billion. Imagine this kind of money which has been made available in the hands of women. Uh, simple things like opening of a bank account through the Pradhan Mantri Jandhan Yojana has happened. Over a period of the last five years, the National Rural Livelihoods Mission has seen a great impetus. And now we're in a stage where we want to take up this program to another level. That's the National Rural Economic Transformation Program, which is again supported by the World Bank. And bringing in the experience that we've had so far from many states like Kerala, Jharkhand, Bihar, UP, et cetera. One of the heartening things that has happened in the recent past is there are states in the southern part of the country which have always been moving ahead. And they have been kind of the torchbearers or the leaders of development in the rural space as well. The heartening thing that has happened in the last few years is states like Bihar, UP, West Bengal, these are all economically backward states. Here, the credit mobilization has increased from 10% to 24%. And why I give this figure, this is important that these are the states where maximum poverty is witnessed. There have been a lot of innovations. We in India are very proud to say that now we can transact money into each and everybody's account, including that of an MG and REGS worker, which is the largest uh, right to work program currently in the world, I would say. The digital platforms are robust, but we need more transaction-based IT platforms more of aggregation to happen, more of rural entrepreneurs to come into the rural space to mobilize these women. So, so as Laura just mentioned, the productivity of a women farmer is roughly 20% lesser. So we have had such a program known, known as the Mahila Kisan or the Women Farmers Development Programs. Almost 6.3 million of women have been mobilized into this program. And there is a strategy to work with these women and uh, to improve their productivity. We are now looking at leveraging uh, IT platforms. We are looking at more of people coming in as agripreneurs, as social entrepreneurs, and coming in working in the value chains. Uh, a Section 8 company, which is a company has been set up to take up all the spaces uh, or, or take up the initiative of Im improving upon the rural livelihoods of these women. Okay, so. right. Should we um, move on uh, to, to, the, to the next uh, speaker? Um, thank you very much, Alka. Um, and we're going to get back to a lot of these issues, especially the gender issue. Um, next speaker is Prosper Mulindwa. He's the vice mayor in charge of economic development in Rulindo District in Rwanda. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, Rulindo District is uh, a district of Rwanda, uh, one out of 30 forming the country, dominated by the hills ranging between 1,600 uh, uh, meters to 
2,300 meters altitude. Uh, the district uh, had uh, the great needs of infrastructures in water and roads, but also it needed to modernize its agriculture because 85% uh, of its population uh, practice agriculture. So we, from 2010, we had a great project to supply water in all the districts uh, under the everyone forever concept. And now we are at 98% uh, of achieving the target. On agriculture, we have uh, five main water catchment. And to help farmers have stable land and fertile land, we do radical terraces and progressive terraces. We uh, support irrigation project systems. And now uh, we are on the way reducing the poverty that was uh, a half of the population was in poverty and uh, uh, we implement the, the district development strategy uh, up to 2024 and uh, we implement everything through the joint planning, uh, all partners of the district, private sector, civil society organization and the government form what we call joint action development forum. We plan together and we all uh, target the priorities that were identified in the, the, uh, the district development strategy and to achieve, to make it real, we implement a homegrown solution performance contract. We call it IMIHIGO and we set targets of every year and the mayor uh, signs with the president of the republic and there will be a ranking after the end of every year and our district performed the second, the second in the countrywide. And uh, out of the catchment that I have mentioned, we have one catchment called Muyanza, and uh, we run together with the Ministry of Agriculture, supported by the World Bank, a project that solved uh, most of the issues. I will mention seven uh, that were attacking the people. Uh, one was the soil erosion and land degradation. We have uh, had uh, 2,550 hectares of land with radical terraces, uh, where 1,100 is uh, irrigated by the dam that was constructed with 2.2 million of cubic meters and with the system of pipes where in every uh, 50 meters there is a water outlet and the farmers use horse pipes to irrigate. We are no longer depending on rain. And uh, uh, the third is the poor uh, agricultural practices that uh, was dominant in the region. Now we have a strong extension service whereby we have had new four cooperatives uh, based on the strong foundation of uh, uh, farmer uh, group, self-help group, and uh, the market is well organized. We are now exporting uh, the cash crop to the Netherlands, I mean the summer flowers. We are exporting the uh, chili to UK. We are exporting uh, ginger to South Africa, but we have also organized our selected crops, maize, beans, uh, and uh, uh, other uh, local uh, crops. We have uh, solved the problem of uh, the scattered settlement. We have now a new uh, integrated development uh, program village where we observe 11 pillars in one village so that one settled in that village will meet education, health, and other basic needs. We have... 
So can, let, let's get to, are, are you on, we'll get to the, the follow up on this, we'll run through so we get to each panelist in time, so Thank well, you. Prosper. Thank you very much. Um, our, our next uh, uh, panelist is uh, Mr. Hank Smith. He's a farmer and board member of Boeren Natur um, in the Netherlands. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, Boeren Natur roughly translates as farmers in nature. Um, which sometimes is expected to be uh, controversial uh, on one side the agriculture, another side the nature. Uh, but I really don't think that that's the fact. Uh, except one exemption will come back in the in the end. Um, in in the Netherlands, um, after the Second World War, there were two tasks that were uh, given to uh, from society, and one was uh, never a war again, and the second one was no hunger. Um, and the farmers stepped in the plate for the second one. They started producing, and they produced a lot, and they had high standards of quality and a low price uh, for the consumer. And we were very good at that. We had institutions like Wageningen University for that, the farmers were educated for that, and we became, although we are a small country with only 16,000 square miles uh, of land and 17 million people, the second uh, world largest exporter in agricultural goods. Uh, the U.S. is number one, and we uh, export and value the, uh, the, the, the are in the second place. Um, and in that country, uh, we also produce uh, civil um, services goods. Um, the difficulty um, is with that that the society wanted the food. Uh, now, what society wants is a different thing. Society wants clean air, healthy soils, biodiversity, and a diverse landscape where they can recreate and uh, see that uh, how the countryside is, the rural, the rural area. Um, so the farmers that have to be in a transition from only producing that one product which they bring to the market to something else delivering to uh, society. Uh, the, uh, the bottleneck in that is how do you get paid for delivering that, uh, um, that, civil, that civil goods, so to say. Um, in the Netherlands, we, uh, we, we love cooperatives. Uh, we, we grew with it, we were successful that with producing food. Uh, now we're doing that also uh, within our umbrella organization, uh, Boer Nature. We have 40 groups of farmers, cooperatives, uh, which work in their each uh, distinct area, um, spread out through the entire of the Netherlands with their farmers. So what changed since 2016 when we were established is that instead of the government having roughly between 15,000 and 20,000 applications for uh, government schemes for EU subs subsidies on uh, nature conservation on agricultural land. We uh, bring them together and there's only 40 uh, um, grants asked uh, by the government. Uh, that brought that of every euro in the old system which came from the EU, 42% vaporized in bureaucracy. Uh, so only 58, roughly 60 cents came onto the farmyard. Now we can do it for approximately 15 to 20 percent. Uh, so more money can be brought to the, uh, to the farmer. Um, also, uh, what we do in the farm, uh, farmyard and in the fields is what we think is best, but also what, think what the people from the uh, ecological side think what is best. So we work together. We're not clashing and bashing uh, about who is right and who is wrong, because we all agree on the 95%. We only clash about the last 5%. So what we learned is doing that together as government, farmers, uh, and organization. Um, our organization is run by farmers. Uh, the farmers work there. And uh, we hire people that have knowledge on fields we don't have to bring it to the table to uh, come forward. Uh, the point I mentioned before is where nature and uh, agriculture might clash is right at this moment in the Netherlands uh, for the first time, um, I was I believe seven or eight years old, 30 years ago, the farmers protested in the Netherlands for the uh, cap policy that changed in the EU. Uh, now 30 years later, the first time that uh, farmers protest again in the Netherlands. And that is because bureaucracy won from common sense. Uh, so from 1st of October, this is the third time that roughly 10,000 farmers come to The Hague, our capital, uh, 4,000 on their tractors, so it's the bi biggest traffic jams ever in the <laughs> Netherlands. Um, you, you can imagine. But what we are asking for is respect. We have the respect from the, uh, from the people. That is not the problem. What we need the respect from uh, the people that make the legislation. They have to talk with us and not about us. And um, I think that is important uh, to acknowledge.
Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let's move on to uh, Patricia Kishinga. She's the head of productions at the media company uh, Kenya, uh, which is very interesting, provides uh, agriculture-related education and entertainment through our innovative ICT to millions of listeners. And we have to start with a, a short trailer to watch um, at the beginning. So go ahead. <laughs> We have traveled all over Kenya to find hard-working farmers. We want to celebrate them while giving them the help they need to improve their farms. Get better yields. And build profitable businesses. We will see how farmers from across the region can benefit from our experts' advice. While also learning from each other in so many ways. Join us on these journeys and share in the farmers' experiences as they shape up their shambas. Karibu to the Shamba Ship Up Safari. <laughs> Thank you. Please, Patricia. Um, yes, the media company looks at how you, we can support development and education using media. And we first started out doing a radio program that was called Tembeana Majira in the late 90s and the 2000s. Um, Tembeana Majira essentially just means walking the time. So we used to cover a lot of social issues, a lot of agriculture. But in 2002, we found that um, our audience was going down. So we'd moved from an audience of 8 million listeners to about 1.2. So we decided to do a piece of research to find out why that was happening. And what we found out were two things. Um, in Kenya, the government had just regulated the FM stations. So we no longer had just one station. So we now had a lot of FM stations coming up. And then the other thing is that there was a black and white TV set that had just come into the market. Um, this was called the Great Wall of China. So a lot of people were now buying this and were now switching on to TV. So radio sort of became like a secondary thing. This was something people would listen to when they were preparing to go to work, preparing the kids to go to school. Or s for the urban people is when they were driving to work. That's when they would listen to radio. We also found that with the FM stations, it was very hard for us to put any edutainment, as we call it, which is uh, programs that were educational and entertaining at the same time in an FM stations, because the way our FMs are uh, uh, sort of like uh, structured was, you know, music, music, uh, the news, and then a call-in session on how to catch a good guy when you already have another guy. Mm -hmm. So it's that kind of thing that happens. <laughs> so it was very hard for us to put any educational content. So we then decided to move on to TV. And we started off with a drama series called Maputano Junction. Uh, that had a lot of issues to do with governance, education. And once in a while, we did agricultural stuff. And throughout all our productions, what we do is we do a CAP study. That's knowledge, attitude, and uh, practice, we find out what do you know, what do you think, what are you practicing uh, before we do the show and after, just to find you know, what is the increase. We found that 70% of the Makutano Junction audience was rural and peri-urban. So we decided we needed to do something, and hence we came up with the show Shamba Shape Up, which has been going on for the last uh, 10 years. It's a makeover reality on smallholder farms. We go to your farm, we ask you, John, what is your problem? Uh, he'll probably say, my cow is not producing enough milk, my maize, I'm not doing very well with my one acre where I've planted my maize. Um, his wife may say, my kitchen garden is a mess. Um, so we bring in the experts. We work with commercial sector and both uh, donor and uh, research organizations. Um, we start broadcasting in March, just before the rains, and go throughout the growing season. Currently, uh, we have an 8 million audience within East Africa. And the show is backed up by an SMS system where farmers are, you know, have the opportunity to call in, ask questions. And right now, we have 275,000 farmers re registered onto that. We know wh where they are, what they're farming. And it's a very, interaction. It's a very interactive system. Thank you. OK, thank you very much, Patricia. Um, we're gonna, our final panelist is uh, Mr. Ignacio Martinez. He's a board director at Indigo Agriculture and partner at Flagship Pioneering in the United States. And he's going to talk about leveraging science and technology to improve soil health, store carbon, and transform the farmer buyer consumer landscape. Please. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> and thank you for the invite. So um, as mentioned, I'm a general partner at Flagship Pioneering, founding uh, director at Indigo Agriculture, and also co-founded and, and uh, founding CEO of three other, uh, three other agricultural companies called Inari Agriculture, Civil Technologies, and Biosciences. Uh, 
Flagship is a unique institution in the sense that we combine under one umbrella three different domains. So we are scientists. Uh, we have a group of around 100 people uh, thinking about science and, and developing uh, hypotheses that we validate. We go to the labs, we validate um, do, uh, our hypothesis by doing experiments physically in labs that we have around Cambridge in, in Massachusetts. Uh, we file for IP, we, we have a strong scientific background. Uh, the second domain, the main is that we are founders of our companies. So we found companies, that's the product of what we do. Uh, we have founded more than 100 companies in the human healthcare space and in sustainability, specifically in AC. We have been um, very active during the last few years. We have started these four companies that I mentioned. Um, and we are also investors, so this is the third dimension. We have now $3.3 billion under management that comes from institutional investors, and we deploy this capital uh, in this breakthrough technology companies that we develop. And we bring also others at later stages of the company to co-invest with us and grow these companies. Uh, so as you, as, as you can imagine, we go from not having nothing, just an idea, to prototyping a company, developing the company, uh, and then growing the company. So I always say that it's like children, and every, every single phase of the company creation has different problems. Um, we have been very active in agriculture, as I mentioned, uh, since I joined around seven years ago. Uh, Flagship as an institution is very, very strong in human healthcare and developing platform technologies uh, for human health. And um, obviously, there is a lot of connectivity between human health and agriculture because everybody eats. Uh, so we have developed uh, these platform companies to work in areas like soil health, uh, biological ways of controlling pests and disease, uh, digital technologies, and, and we like to explore digital technologies in two ways. One is by creating marketplaces that will give transparency to the agricultural system, but also combining science-based approaches with digital to develop uh, what we call science-based computational uh, models at a scale. Um, these four companies have now collectively more than 1,200 employees. They operate, they are based, all of them in Cambridge as headquarters, but they have uh, different locations in the US. They are operating in Australia, India, uh, uh, Brazil, Argentina, Europe. So it's, all these platforms are really, really scalable. And I will finalize by saying that one of the things that was said before, all we do is learn from nature and all the technologies that we develop are uh, nature-based. Very good. Thank you very much. Could you talk, we'll continue down sure. um, with Ignacio, in terms of, you, you talked about a broad array of countries, a lot of developing world, but all, a developed world, but also the developing world, and the prospects looking into developing countries for the disruptive technologies that you're thinking about. Yeah, so we see that the, the, we think that the agriculture industry uh, is going through a fundamental transformation, like um, I was probably not born when the last one happened, but we see a lot of breakthrough technologies coming into play that enables entrepreneurs, technology entrepreneurs, uh, and investors to deploy capital and develop these technologies uh, independently of big ag corporations or big ag companies. So think of gene editing, think of biological solutions uh, to control insects. Uh, the regulatory frameworks are more favorable than all technologies that big incumbents are, incumbents are using. So if you have a combination of an entrepreneurial mindset, uh, breakthrough technologies, and you can develop multiple products, candidates, very, very fast, and you can envision different business models that enables you uh, to go to farmers directly and create a lot of disruption in the classical value chain, you can envision different, different ways of interacting with farmers. So that goes from countries like the US to other countries that are more underdeveloped and they are more um, rural farmers in different geographies. It's difficult to reach because of the challenges that we mentioned earlier about connectivity in, the, in some digital solutions, but we are on a mission to offer solutions and make them really, really scalable um, and enabling farmers to have more transparency, learn from others in a more scalable way, and, and your program is one, one way of doing it. Um, and having uh, tools at their disposal that probably today they don't have. Great. Let's let's move back into into gender and go to, with starting with Patricia. Um, you know, women get information differently, perhaps. And and you know, how do you work in your programs to to deal with um, you know issues of gender, making sure that women are are getting messages, agricultural messages, and then and then we'll move over to uh, Alka and, and, and Prosper, and we, wanna, we know that investments in 
rural areas can empower women, they can also disempower women. And what, what do you do you know, to make sure that, that what, you're, what you're working on is, is empowering women? Let's start with Patricia. Okay, within our program, uh, as we go searching for these farms in order to film with them, we find um, a lot of farms in East Africa that women are the ones who provide the labor. And what we were seeing, the discrepancy was that when it came to going to the markets, the man then comes into it. So it was very essential for us to look for to educate our women farmers that they can also go to, to the market. Because a lot of them were saying, well, it's, you know, we fear because of the middlemen who come and will give us, you know, a different price. He'll tell us uh, a, a bag of maize is going for, you know, 800 bob, Kenya shillings. So what we decided to do is when we started Aishamba, we made it very deliberate because uh, there's been a lot of mobile penetration within Kenya is that farmers would register and women were encouraged and within even our show we find that 69% of our viewers are actually women. So we do encourage them to join iShamba and they sign up, you know, and they get called, they ask what's your name, how big is your farm, what are you planting? And we provide them with agri-tips, very specific and very event-based. So they know what, how to farm and what to do if something happens within the farm. And when it gets time to go to the market, we give them the right, the correct market prices so that even when someone is approaching them, telling them, okay, this is what it's going for, they say no, this is what is happening in the market. So that was one way we found that we could empower women is by giving them information in a way that they, they were able to receive it on their mobile phones, because a lot of them were using mobile phones. And also within uh, the program, we encourage and we do feature a lot of women farmers and showing them that, because in East Africa, there's a way that there are some crops that are considered to be female crops. So for example, like beans, that's considered a female crop. But what we started teaching them is that even as you plant your beans, you can even plant a very good variety that's rich in iron that fetches a better a price at the market. Mm. So that's another way we've also been trying to tackle this gender issue. Thank you. Alka? Yes. <clears throat> so I think once the women have money in their hands, it's definitely the best empowerment. And what we've been seeing is, after this entire self-help group movement has taken over, <clears throat> the decision making is now shifting towards women. They are being more exposed to uh, the paradigm of development. I'd also like to mention over here that the, the strategy has been to work for the poor through the institutions of the poor. So how does this happen? This happens through the community resource persons who are from the field. And they are intrinsically bringing in the knowledge of the field and also getting trained or their capacities are being development, uh, developed in terms of the new technological advancements that are happening. So the women are getting this entire exposure. I'd also like to say, mention over here, so we have these huge areas which are unbanked areas. Uh, and our Prime Minister has also been talking about financial inclusion, digital literacy. How does this function? So we have trained these women to become the banking correspondents. And they are the ones who are now working in the field, acting as working correspondents, making a living out of this. And now women find it more easy to approach this woman banking correspondent to withdraw the money because women had this hesitation about going to the banks. They were intimidated by that banking environment. Now the bank is theirs, the woman is theirs, and a lot of empowerment has happened in this particular fashion. Uh, everything starts when the political will wishes so. Uh, the constitution of Rwanda uh, states that in every elected body, there must be at least 30% of women in the governance. And that goes beyond uh, the government institutions, but up to the cooperatives and group members so that this, m women participate in de decision making. Now, it is real even in those cooperatives and those self-help group. Secondly, the government has a uh, plan to support women and youth uh, in facilitation of the guarantee. The collateral was the main issue that women and youth were facing. And now they support up to 75% in getting uh, funded in the bank or uh, by the guarantees. And uh, uh, thirdly, it is the competitions in agribusinesses 
to support women and youth uh, projects so that there are many in agribusinesses and uh, uh, in all, everything in uh, agriculture. Good. Let's, let's talk a little bit about um, um, nature-based production and farmers as both producers of food and producers of, of ecosystem services. And, and uh, Henk, you, this, is, this is something you're working on in, in, the, in the Netherlands. And uh, this is, the Netherlands has a tradition of this, and you've been working on it for a while. Do you have things to talk to, to say for, for other people in the world, you know, lessons to, to, to give to, the, uh, to others? Um, yeah, well, when I go back in history uh, for myself, um, Roughly about 20 years ago, um, farmers started coming together as um, nature conservation groups uh, where they uh, came to uh, count the birds, uh, put uh, measurements in place that, that helps uh, birds with uh, raising their chicks in the field so the, the grass wasn't cut just before the, the chicks would hatch. Um, things like that. Um, and that started and it was soft. But the farmers were um, a, bit, a bit grumpy about the, the checks they got from government, the penalties they got, uh, that it wasn't uh, practical. For example, if you had a wet area, uh, they would come on the 1st of February and check if the area had 10 centimeters of water. If it was freezing 15 degrees, uh, it doesn't matter. They came and checked, and you got a penalty when it wasn't there. Um, so all those, those uh, uh, grumpy people, so to say, came together to organize and be a fist uh, against the government and make it easier and make it better. Um, that spread out through the Netherlands and we became maybe two, three hundred uh, groups of farmers uh, doing that. Uh, but, but in time things improved, but we could do uh, it in a better way. As I mentioned before, uh, we could do it more cost effective. We thought we could do it more efficient and more practical, just with common sense. Um, not uh, let us stop by the tradition or the bureaucracy of, or uh, that can't be done. Uh, we said, uh, we, we can do it. Um, and we had the mentality uh, to go for it. Uh, so we, we came together with government and said, we, we want to change the system. Government looked at it and said, well, it's ambitious, but we can, we can ask. So the Dutch uh, went to Brussels, where the CAP is made, the Common Agriculture Policy, and they asked uh, a whole lot. They asked for so much uh, as Dutch government, expecting only this much to get, get in. But uh, by surprise, they got everything they asked, mm. the whole chunk. Um, so they also the government wanted to deliver. The farmers wanted to deliver. And the people that were uh, e ecological involved said, well, there's something that can be uh, made better, and we can do it in a practical way. So then we were there, shoulder by shoulder, going forward. Um, and that really worked. Uh, not asking what's uh, uh, possible, just saying, we want to do this, uh, and can you help us with this, uh, reaching that goal? And I think that's very uh, important to recognize um, we as farmers on the ground know, uh, know best what's good for our area, what's the tradition in that area, how, how to go forward instead of being top down. Okay. Ignacio, what is the role of environmental considerations in, in your business decisions, in your investments, and the way you bring technologies to, to, to different markets? Does the yeah, so it's, it's a really important point as part of our sustainability practice, but everything we do, again, is, is nature-based, we learn from nature. It's about, it's targeted to, to, to things, is producing a better crop uh, with less resources and with different resources. So we all know that farmers have been using the tools they have today because there are not many other options. And if you offer them solutions that are better for the environment and they can make more profit, they obviously will change and then will change quickly. And, and we have examples like, for example, Indigo Agriculture, which is now, uh, lo we launched the over Terraton initiative with the idea of compensating farmers to, um, to um, restore carbon and be more, more uh, profitable by doing a sustainable practice, which is something that was, that was missing at a scale before. Uh, but everything we, we do going from insect control, tree health, um, computational uh, approaches to enable people to do what they do more efficiently and be more profitable more for profitable economically and more profitable for the environment. Thank you. I, I hope you've enjoyed this conversation as much as I have. Let's thank our panelists for their, their contributions.
Okay, and, and we're going to stay here um, while we invite um, Axel von Totzenberg to uh, please join us. Uh, he's the newly appointed Managing Director for Operations, and he's going to sum up and give his views. Thank you, Axel. Good afternoon. Uh, I, I'm afraid I'm not going to sum up because I will be honest, I was not in the room. <laughs> so uh, I think in, instead of pretending uh, that I have heard and, and read and something, uh, let me just uh, make a couple of, of points. First, uh, the question why rural? It seems to me that is uh, absolutely necessary. We t discuss a lot in the bank about uh, urbanization, particularly because urbanization has been also an, a tremendous source of uh, economic growth, if you uh, looked at particularly in Asia. Uh, but the bank has to be about uh, balance and, and has to look uh, also having a certain bias. Bi uh, 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 the balance is that we need to look also at the rural sector. And we should not forget that still 45% of the population lives in in rural areas, that's uh, way over three billion people. But there is a bias of the bank in this. And the reason is that 80% or, uh, of, of the extreme poor are still living in rural areas. So if we have extreme poor of about 700 million, of which 560 uh, million people are in the rural areas, we better focus on this. And we should have a bias towards that because that is our mission and therefore we, we should not forget about this. I think what we are trying to do is clearly that um, uh, we, we keep a uh, fairly solid lending program in rural development. Uh, if you look at the IBRD and about IDA, you get in the last three years in, on average in the order of seven, seven and a half billion dollars. Uh, that is about 15% of, of the total uh, lending program. But we try to capture uh, uh, this, uh, this, this problem of, of, of poverty and then ultimately of the rural sectors, of course, certainly in our negotiations uh, uh, in, in the IDA context, where we have a couple of special themes, and I would like to touch upon this. First of all, and that we need to, to keep in mind is, is that when we discuss this increasingly, uh, this, the, the, the replenishment, we have the borrower representatives there. And uh, for them, the number one issue is jobs and economic transformation. And that is not uh, jobs in, in only in the cities, it's also job in the rural sectors. It may not be the official though, it may be informal jobs, but we need to see how can we create much more possibilities in this sector. And that means to see how we can actually incentivize um, uh, uh, agriculture production that uh, touches on clearly on things on, on policies, pricing policies, infrastructure policies, uh, but also uh, we need to uh, keep in mind that we uh, have to do uh, a, a stimulate agriculture productivity. In many of the areas, agriculture research as has been done by CGR has been hugely, spectacularly successful in Asia. In, uh, in Africa, it has been often very flat. So there is an, a, a new frontier where a lot yeah, still need to be done and we need to, uh, uh, to face this. Is. Secondly uh, is climate change. We, uh, we, we bring out uh, uh, these reports that uh, say, well, climate change will disproportionately uh, affect uh, the poor. Well, which poor? Uh, probably a lot in the rural areas, and, and they will be uh, disproportionately affected. So what we have to say is that when we are thinking about mitigation and adaptation, you cannot just link that from, from, from the rural sectors, and we, uh, we got to be much, much, much focused uh, on this. Another factor is when I said jobs and, e uh, and economic transformation is uh, we should not do that uh, in the old fashioned way that we think the man will do it. In fact, the men probably are the least effective in this. We have to actually empower many more women in, in this area. And I think the whole 
agenda on rural development has to be intrinsically linked with the gender agenda in, in order empowering women in, in, in this. And, give, uh, and in that sense, also think not only uh, of um, that you empower them, but, but basically on the whole education system, the, 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 uh, the, the uh, rural credit that basically women get much more easier access also uh, to finance so that they can actually uh, do the, this product. So I think this is something, uh, uh, it seems to me, uh, fairly uh, uh, concrete. Um, and then finally, unfortunately, what we uh, are struggling with is that there are, is an increasing number of fragile states, and particularly in the low-income countries. And if you are now looking at our projections, if this trend continued by 2030, over uh, half of the extreme poor will be living in fragile countries. Now, assume that that same relationship remains, that 80% is, uh, of the current extreme poor are living in rural areas, you can see what that means for also fragile states. It is going to be uh, a, 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 a predominantly rural problem, but also particularly in the fragile side. You have, therefore, the double challenge on this. How do you deal with it when you are thinking about fragility and about getting out of fragility? And you will need, therefore, also to think on how you start connecting agricultural uh, 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 policies, but also in general rural uh, approaches towards actually solving uh, this fragility problem. And, and we have had a lot of discussions. Uh, we are right now in the process of the, the, uh, uh, designing an, a new uh, strategy for the fragile and conflict uh, affected states. But there, one of the prominent thing is to understand the drivers of the conflict. And when you are talking about the drivers, you will need to also to go into the rural areas and to, to start thinking of what are the possibilities. So uh, uh, what this all means is that it is uh, an incredibly important that we actually debate this. I think we also need to, to see uh, uh, it, uh, that there are the challenges, but also the opportunities on this. And I think what we need to, to see that in many countries, a successful rural development have been part and parcel of successful development. And we need to learn from this. We need to think what actually the new science or digitalization or, uh, uh, and new ways of communications can meet for, uh, uh, for, for rural areas. It's very nice to see. Sometimes we have now already projects that, uh, that are uh, explicitly fi uh, financing uh, the digitalization in African countries so that you can do more on this. So I think there are very good uh, concrete steps forward. At the same time, I think what we have uh, to keep in mind and in our narrative about poverty reduction, um, we can know that, well, it is only, well, we'll drive that growth in the urban areas. Well, we'll need to look uh, very sharply on what we can do uh, in the rural areas. And particularly, I think, if we look at that, the IDA context, the fragile states, then big zones like the Sahel zone, uh, where we have a particular challenge. And what we will need is, is uh, mutual learning and, f host, uh, and uh, foremost action. Um, this, is, this is an organization that should not only limit itself to maybe also sharing good ideas, but it is to be an, uh, an, 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 an organization that moves this. And if we are moving seven and a half, maybe we need to move more, and we need to move it effectively and have results. That should be the focus. But I would like to thank the panelists for having taken the time to come A, to, the, to Washington, and B, uh, to debate something that uh, will be with us uh, uh, for, for years to come, and we'll need to keep uh, the focus on it, and thanks for doing so. Thank you. Thank you very much for attending.